you are locked in. You're listening to 97.5 All In Radio, where we have real-life conversations about real-life situations, and we play gospel music from artists worldwide. Stay locked in. One God, One Love. 97.5 All In Radio. Yo, what's good, fam? This is George, you're the Yost King. I want to welcome everybody right here at 97.5 All In Radio. We got another good one for you today. To God be all the glory. It ain't going to change to God changing. You heard me yesterday, family. So thank you all for tuning in today. Listen, family, we got coming up today. You heard me? We got TEDx Talk today again. You heard me? Like I said, it ain't going to change to God changing. Uh, we still speaking against school violence and violence in the community. You heard me yesterday, One God, One Love. So we got coming up today from TEDx Talk. We got, um, let me see, we got um, One God, One Love. We got Brother brother um, Jeffrey Brown, How We Cut Violence Down. Brother Jeffrey Brown. And we also got another TEDx, The Cycle, The Cycle of Violence. Breaking the Cycle of Violence. Brother Speaker, um, the Speaker, Brother Speaker, Sherman Patterson. You heard me? Y'all know it's going to be good today. You dig, family? Yes, indeed. We want it every day to be good. Every day to hurt for the nurture your soul, man. And um, we pray that it's really sink down into your spirit. You understand? Please share this with your family. If you're with your family, especially with your kids. You heard me? Let's make it a family thing. Every time you hear 97.5 All In Radio, let's make it a family, a family gathering. You dig? One God, one love. So thank y'all for tuning in. Come back with us right here at 97.5 All In Radio. Y'all already know what time it is. That's how we do it, fam. Yes, indeed. I want the people of God there. <laughs> hey, me thank you for the breath of life. The only chance where you give me, I may never get it right. And a long time, me I put up a fight, but you never let go, never let go. You are awesome, mighty, wonderful, my king in every way.
You gotta feel me on this one You know how we roll The truth Let's go Life is like a roller coaster, man, it has its ups and downs People so-called call your friends, be the main ones, let you down Sometimes it feel like you're going to surf, it don't matter who's around I know I have my good days, bad is not too far behind Being fake contagious, but that is where I draw the line Why you laughing in my face, talk bad about when I'm not around They hated me before they hated you, that's what Jesus said Didn't think that that was true until sat down and the Bible read If people would tell the truth how free this whole world would be These haters are my motivation Truth is love's chemistry God made someone for you Just like he made someone for me I know I'm not of this world But this is the place I gotta be Life is like a roller coaster Buckle up your seatbelt All I hear is people talking How he and she felt Man, we gotta play this card This the hand that we've been dealt People so emotional They only strive for themselves Life is like a roller coaster Buckle up your seatbelt Belt. All I hear is people talking how he and she felt Man, we gotta play these cards, this the hand that we've been dealt People so emotional, they only strive for themselves Preachers preaching in the pulpit, but really don't understand Saying God said this and that, taking money from the hands Teaching what they wanna teach, just to get a standing hand Did I mention God said and peace, cause they're running like a Taliban Spirit saw through the church, but where is the deliverance? Jesus cast out devils and demons just by speaking a word, man. Being a Christian, a lifestyle, not just another trend. Righteousness got moved out with a Baptist banker on one hand. Life is like a roller coaster, buckle up your seat belts. All I hear is people talking how he and she felt. Man, we gotta play this cause, it's the hand that we've been dealt. People so emotional, they only strive for themselves. Life is like a roller coaster, buckle up your seat belts. All I hear is It's the hand that we've been dealt People so emotional They only strive for themselves Okay, there they go Someone they talk about You know the one that saying they live Doing a little ride They live their testimony Oh, some be living phony Hate to recognize the truth When they see they homies You see they want no more They understand the sword They felt the arrow from the stage God show his grace Now nah, I really you want it we have our drills and drafts, we have our time when we fail, but God's a real deal. Just think about it, all that time that we should have mind, and when we fell in the trap, who we call that? Jesus, okay, don't that sound familiar? Repent and drift and chill, yeah, know the deal, in real life, life is like a roller coaster, don't be afraid, hold tight, keep your faith close. Roller coaster, people talking, play these cards, emotional themselves. Roller coaster, people talking, play these cards, emotional themselves. Life is like a roller coaster, buckle up your seatbelts All I hear is people talking how he and she felt Man, we gotta play these cards, it's the hand that we've been dealt People so emotional, they only strive for themselves Life is like a roller coaster, buckle up your seatbelts All I hear is people talking how he and she felt Man, we gotta play these cards, it's the hand that we've been dealt People so emotional, they only strive for themselves People so emotional, they only strive for themselves. Because people so emotional, they only strive for themselves. Yeah. You are locked in. You're listening to 97.5 All In Radio, where we have real life conversations about real life situations. And we play gospel music from artists worldwide. Stay locked in. One God, one love. 97.5 All In Radio.
Hey, welcome back right here to the four five All In Radio. I'm your host, Joseph King. Listen, starting off the first, the first set, you heard me, yes indeed, music by, music by sister Sasha called Mighty. She's out of Jamaica. God bless my sister, yes indeed, one God, one love. And Roller Coaster, the artist named Solo T, featuring Lilia Gamage and Joseph King. You heard me, out of Orlando, Florida. Solo T. Featuring Lydia Gamage out of Orlando, Florida, and Joseph King. You heard me. Life is like a roller coaster. Thank you for tuning in. We got coming up uh, from TEDx Talk, Brother Jeffrey Brown, How We Cut Down Violence. You heard me? So it's coming up. Yes, indeed. Right here, 97.5, all in radio. I've learned some of my most important life lessons from drug dealers and gang members and prostitutes. And I've had some of my most profound theological conversations, not in the hallowed halls of a seminary, but on a street corner on a Friday night, 1 a.m., that's, that's a little unusual, since I am a Baptist minister, seminary trained, and pastored a church for over 20 years. But it's true. It came as a part of my participation in a public safety crime reduction strategy that saw a 79% reduction in violent crime uh, over an eight-year period in a major city. But I didn't start out wanting to be a part of somebody's crime reduction strategy. Uh, I was 25, had my first church. If you would have asked me what my ambition was, I would have told you I wanted to be a mega church pastor. I wanted a 15, 20,000 member church. I wanted my own television ministry. I wanted my own clothing line. <laughs> I wanted to be your long-distance carrier, you know, the whole nine yards. <laughs> you know. After about a year of pastoring, my membership went up about 20 members. Right? So, so, you know, megachurch was way down the road, right? But seriously, if you would have said, what is your ambition? I would have said just to be a good pastor, to be able to be with people through all the passages of life, to preach messages that would have an everyday meaning for folks, and, and the African-American tradition uh, to be able to represent the community that I serve. But there was something else that was happening in my city and in the entire metro area, and in most metro areas in the United States, and that was the homicide rate started to rise precipitously. And there were young people who were killing each other for reasons that I thought were very trivial, you know, like bumping into someone in a high school hallway, uh, uh, and then after school, uh, shooting the person. Someone uh, with the wrong color shirt on, in the wrong street corner, at the wrong time. And, and something needed to be done about that. Uh, it got to the point where it started to change the character of the city. You could go to any housing project, for example, like the one that was down the street from my church, and you'd walk in, and it would be like a ghost town, because the parents wouldn't allow their kids to come out and play, even in the summertime, because of the violence. You would listen in the neighborhoods on any given night, and, and to the untrained ear, it sounded like fireworks, but it was gunfire. You'd hear it almost every night when you were cooking dinner, telling your child a bedtime story, or just watching TV. And you can go to any emergency room at any uh, hospital, and you would see lying on gurneys uh, young black and Latino men shot and dying. And I was doing funerals, but not of the venerated matriarchs and patriarchs, you know, who lived a long life, and, and there's a lot to say. But I was doing funerals of 18-year-olds, and 17-year-olds, and 16-year-olds. And I was standing 
at a church or at a funeral home struggling to say something that, that would make some meaningful impact. And so while my colleagues were building these cathedrals, great and tall, and buying property outside of the city and, and moving their congregations out so that they could create or recreate their cities of God. Uh, the social structures in the inner cities were sagging under the weight of all of this violence. And so I stayed because somebody needed to do something. And so I looked at what I had and, and, and moved on that. I started to preach the crying, the violence in the community. And I started to look at the programming in my church, and I started to build programs that would catch the at-risk youth, you know, those who are on the fence to the violence. I even tried to be innovative in my preaching. You all have heard of uh, rap music, right? Rap music? I even tried to rap sermon one time. You know. It didn't work, but I mean, at least I tried it, you know. I'll never forget the young person who came to me after that, that sermon, and he waited till everybody was gone, and he said, Rev, rap sermon, huh? And I was like, yeah, what do you think? He said, don't do that again, Rev. (laughs) But I preached and I built these programs and I thought maybe if my colleagues did the same that it would make a difference. But the violence just careened out of control and people who were not involved in the violence were getting shot and killed. You know, somebody going to buy a pair of cig- uh, a, a, a pack of cigarettes at a convenience store, or, or someone who was sitting at a bus stop just waiting for a bus, or, or kids who were playing in the park, oblivious to the violence on the other side of the park, but it coming and visiting them. Things were out of control, and I didn't know what to do. And then something happened that changed everything for me. It's a kid by the name of Jesse McKee walking home with his friend Rigoberto Carrion to the housing project down the street from my church. They met up with a group of youth who were fr- was from a gang in, in Dorchester, and, and they were killed. But as Jesse was running from the scene mortally wounded, he was running in the direction of my church. He died some 100, 150 yards away. If he would have gotten to the church, it wouldn't have made a difference because the lights were out. Nobody was home. And I took that as a sign. When they caught some of the youth that had done this deed, to my surprise, they were around my age. But the gulf that was between us was vast. It's like we were in two completely different worlds. And so as I contemplated all of this and looked at at what was happening, I suddenly realized that there was a paradox that was emerging inside of me. And the paradox was this. In all of those sermons that I preached to crying the violence, I was also talking about building community. But I suddenly realized that there was a certain segment of the population that I was not including in my definition of community. And so the paradox was this. If I really wanted the community that I was preaching for, I needed to reach out and embrace this group that I had cut out of my definition which meant not about building programs to catch those who were on the fences of violence, but to reach out and to embrace those who were committing the acts of violence, the gangbangers, the drug dealers. As soon as I came to that realization, a quick question came to my mind. Why me? I mean, isn't this a law enforcement issue? This is why we have the police, right? As soon as the question why me came, the answer came just as quickly. Why me? Because I'm the one who can't sleep at night thinking about it. Because I'm the one looking around saying, somebody needs to do something about this, and I'm starting to realize that that someone is me. I mean, isn't that how movements start anyway? They don't start with a, a grand convention and people coming together and then walking in lockstep, you know, with a, with a statement. But it starts with just a few, or maybe just one. It started with me that way. And so I decided to figure out the culture of violence by which these young people who were committing them existed, and I started to volunteer at the high school. After about two weeks of volunteering at the high school, I realized that the youth that I was trying to reach, they weren't going to high school. 
I started to walk in the community, and it didn't take a rocket scientist to realize that they weren't out during the day. And so I started to walk the streets at night, late at night, going into the parks where they were building the relationships that was necessary. A tragedy happened in Boston that brought a number of clergy together, and there was a small cadre of us. Who came to the realization that we had to come out of the four walls of our sanctuary and meet the youth where they were, and not try to figure out how to bring them in? So we decided to walk together. We would get together in one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the city on a Friday night and on a Saturday night at 10 p.m. and we'd walk till two, three in the morning. I imagine we were quite the anomaly when we first started walking. I mean, you know, we weren't. Drug dealers. We weren't drug customers.、Uh, we weren't the police. Some of us would have collars on. It was probably a really odd thing. But they started speaking to us after a while, and what we found out is that while we were walking, they were watching us, and they wanted to make sure of a couple of things. That number one, that we were going to be consistent in our behavior, that we would keep coming out there, and then secondly, they wanted to make sure that we weren't out there. To exploit them, because there was always somebody who would say,、oh, "We're going to take back the streets," but they would always seem to have a television camera with them or or a reporter, and they would enhance their own reputation to the detriment of those on the streets. So when they saw that we had none of that, they decided to talk to us, and then we did an amazing thing for preachers: we decided to listen and not preach. Come on, give it up for me. All right, come on, you're cutting into my time now, okay? But it was amazing. I mean, they said, "We don't know." We said to them, "We don't know our own communities after 9 p.m. at night. You know, between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. But you do. You are the subject matter experts, if you will, of that period of time. So talk to us." Teach us. Help us to see what we're not seeing. Help us to understand what we're not understanding. And they were all too happy to do that. And we got an idea of what life on the streets was all about. Very different than what you see on the 11 o'clock news. Very different from what is portrayed in popular media and even social media. And as we were talking with them, a number of myths were dispelled about them with us. One of the biggest myths was that these kids were cold and heartless, and uncharacteristically bold in their violence. What we found out was the exact opposite. Most of the young people who are out there on the streets are just trying to make it on the streets. And we also found out that some of the most intelligent and creative and uh, uh, magnificent. Wise people that that we've ever met were on the street, engaged in a struggle, and I know some of them call it survival, but I call them overcomers, because when you're in the conditions that they're in, to be able to live every day is an accomplishment of overcoming. And as a result of that, we said to them, "How do you see this church? How do you see this institution、uh, helping this situation?" And we developed a plan in conversation with these youth. We stopped looking at them as the problem to be solved, and we started looking at them as partners, as assets, as 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 co-laborers in the struggle to reduce violence in the community. Imagine developing a plan. You have one minister at one table and a, and a heroin dealer at the other table, coming up with a way in which the church. Can help the entire community. The Boston Miracle was about bringing people together. We had other partners. We had law enforcement partners. We had police officers.、Uh, it wasn't the entire force, because there were still some who still had that lock 'em up mentality. But there were other cops who saw the honor in partnering with the community. Who saw the responsibility from themselves to be able to work 
as partners with community leaders and faith leaders in order to reduce violence in the community. Same with probation officers, same with judges, same with folks who are up that law enforcement chain, because they realized, like we did, that we'll never arrest ourselves out of this situation. That there will be not that there will that there will not be enough prosecutions made, and you cannot fill these jails up enough in order to alleviate the problem. I started helped to start an organization、uh, 20 years ago, a faith-based organization to to deal with this issue. I left it about four years ago. And started working in cities across the United States, 19 in total. And what I found out was that in those cities, there was always this component of community leaders who put their heads down and their nose to the grindstone, who checked their egos at the door, and saw the whole as greater than the sum of its parts, and came together and found ways to work with youth out on the streets. That the solution is not、uh, more cops, but the solution is is mining the assets that's there in the community to have a strong community component in the collaboration around violence reduction. Now there is a movement in、uh, the United States of young people who I am very proud of, who are dealing with the structural issues. Uh, that need to change if we're going to be a better society. But there is this political ploy to try to pit、uh, police brutality and、uh, police misconduct against black-on-black -black violence. But it's a fiction. It's all connected. When you think about decades of failed housing policies and and poor educational structures, when you think about persistent Unemployment and underemployment in a community. When you think about poor health care, and then you throw drugs into the mix, and duffel bags full of guns, little wonder that you would see this culture of violence emerge. And then the response that comes from the state is more cops and more suppression of hotspots. It's all connected. And one of the wonderful things that we've been able to do is to be able to show the value of partnering together: community,、uh, law enforcement, private sector,、uh, the city, in order to reduce violence. You have to value that community component. I believe that we can end the era of violence in our cities. I believe that it is possible. And that people are doing it even now, but I need your help. It can't just come from folks who are burning themselves out in the community. They need support. They need help. Go back to your city. Find those people. You need some help. I'll help you out. Find those people. They're there. Bring them together with law enforcement and the private sector and the city. With the one aim of reducing violence, but make sure that that community component is strong, because that old adage that comes from Burundi is right: you know, that you do、uh, for me, without me, you do to me. God bless you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most listened to radio show on the planet.
it was the day after Christmas in, 2000, in 2011. I was at the movies with my wife, Sandy, about to watch Mission Impossible 3. I was excited. When I received a message from work that a three-year-old boy in Minneapolis had been shot in the head. My wife saw the shock, distraught look on my face and grabbed my hand and said, go. I left for North Memorial, North Memorial Hospital where I met the mother and father of the little boy. I introduced myself as Sherman Patterson from Mayor Robeck's office. I asked, how was the little boy doing? And his mother said, not well. His heart had raced to such a pace that he may not make it through, through the night. I gave her a huge hug. While waiting for the little boy to get better, to stabilize, she told me about how he was learning his ABCs, always playing, loving his sisters and brothers. And then she said, she talked about that tragic moment, that at the sound of gunfire, Terrell and the siblings knew to run upstairs to the safe spot in the bathtub. Unfortunately, Terrell did not make it. He wasn't quick enough. Terrell stabilized, and I visited him in his room. All I could see was this little angel, this beautiful little angel lying there resting. The next day, I called Marsha to check on Terrell and I asked, how was he doing? And she said, Sherman, we just disconnected the life support. He's gone. I didn't know what to say. All I could think about was that this little boy would never grow up, never go to school, he wouldn't even be a father. Terrell lived, lived five blocks away from me. I could get there in a couple of minutes. I live in North Minneapolis, a community that's thriving with small businesses, great people, <laughs> artists, Children, it's just a wonderful place. However, like many other major cities, we have our challenges. We are plagued with a cancer that's metastasizing through my community that's called gun violence. In 2004, I was reading on my front porch and I heard a loud bang. I looked up and I saw the ice cream truck stopped in the middle of the road, half a block away. I realized that the ice cream man had just been robbed and shot by a 12 year old boy. That did it for me. I knew I had to get involved. My block had become the home of one of the most notorious young gangs in Minneapolis. Kids between the ages of 13 and 16 years old. 13 and 16 years old. I immediately went to the gang leader, a 15-year-old boy who lived on my block. And I asked him, what's going on? How can I help you? He looked at me in a minute with a menacing stare, very apprehensive, non-trusting. But every day I saw him, I would ask him the same question. Eventually, he warmed up to me. He saw that I was avuncular or approachable, genuine, and authentic. authentic. We began to share our stories, our life stories. 
we would sit down on my front steps in the middle of the street, and he would tell me how he felt hopeless, helpless, his fellow gang members, they thought adults had given up on them, the dysfunctionalism in the home, how they depended on each other. And these young boys is out on the streets shooting and killing other people and each other because they couldn't see any farther than where they were. I gave, I shared my story with him that I was from a broken home. My dad wasn't there, but I had two matriarchs. My 96 year old grandmother, who's cognitive now, who holds me responsible and accountable when I call her. And I say, hi girl, how you doing? She said, boy, don't you call me girl. (laughs) (laughs) And my 72 year old mom. But at the same time, I had anchors around me, anchors of men who held me accountable to be responsible. And they put that on their shoulders. And I told this gang leader that I am responsible for you and I'm gonna put you on my shoulders. Often I would pile a group of the the gang, gang guys in my vehicle, SUV, and we would go out and eat pizza outside of the gang territory. At times I knew I was putting myself at risk because a rival gang could come by and shoot up my vehicle, or even one of the kids could have a gun with them. I never asked. As we would ride, I noticed how they would light up, and like the sun's just shining on them, they became kids again. I would just listen and listen and listen about how they wanted to be teachers, poets, professional athletes, talking about graduating from school, just joshing with one another. This made me feel so, so, so good. Often on the return to Minneapolis and seeing the skyline, I could feel this dark cloud come over my car. They would morph back into these hardened gang members. You could see the stone face Faces in the car, the silence, the hopelessness coming back, feeling helpless, feeling boxed in. When I dropped them off, I often prayed and hoped that they would do well. Some are dead now from the years, several years have passed. Some are dead. Some have committed murders. Some are in prison. However, a few years ago, I saw one of those gang members. Well, I say ex-gang members, because he was 13 at the time. And he came up to me and he said, thank you. He said, Sherman, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for hearing. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being there for us, being there for me. Now he's working, he's taking classes in college, he's healthy, he's moving forward, but most of all, he told me that he's trying to help help young kids and young men who who are in his position, who was in his position. But don't get it twisted. My block is still challenged. I have little kids out playing outside all of the time now. They're happy. They're fulfilled with just joy. And when I come home, in my car, no matter how tired I am, I'm looking in my car, I see them playing outside and they're waiting for me to come. Hey, Sherman. Hey. I get out. And I make sure I take the time, if it's just two minutes, to see how they're doing in school, what's going on in the house. And I'm always talking to the parent or guardian because it's usually not parents. These are my kids on my block. 
I am responsible. Often people say, why don't you just move? I can. But every time I see that smiling face, I'm anchored. So, as I said, we still have our challenges. Just this past Sunday, I came home. Not even 20 yards, 20 feet into my yard. Ten gunshots rang off, rang off four houses from me. A young man had gotten shot. A young gang member had gotten shot. So we are still challenged with that behavior, drugs, the violence. And as I continue to reach out to these kids to help them, to show them, and for them to be responsible, I continue to love them. But according to the Center for Disease Control, in 2013, homicides was the leading cause of death for African Americans between the ages of 15 and 34. The vast majority of those were caused by gun violence. Despite being only 14% of the population, African Americans in 2013 represented over 50% of gun violence deaths in America. In Minneapolis this year, we've had 29 homicides. 22 of those homicides have been committed by gun violence. In a half mile radius of my block, this year we've had two murders committed by gun violence, over 20 people shot, and most of those are black young men. I continue to mentor, I continue to reach out on my block, in my neighborhood, in the city. And this has afforded me the opportunity to create a program called, program called Lead by Example Minneapolis. I have taken 10 young boys between the ages of 12 and 15, six from the Somali Cedar Riverside community and four from North Minneapolis, one who lives across the street from me, and I've been mentoring him since nine, he's been nine years old. Our core, fo core focus is leadership, communication, health and nutrition, characters, and values. We meet once a month. We're sharing, we're bonding, we're taking field trips, but most of all, they're valuing themselves. I love my one-on-one -on -one sessions with these young boys because I'm always just intensely listening to them. How's your day going? What are you exceeding at? Where are you struggling at? What's troubling you? And they will open up to you. During one of our field trips to City Hall, I was watching two of my young boys from LBEM, LBEM walk down the corridor with their arms around each other. As they came by me, Amani said, he was with Abdul, and he said, this is my brother. I got him. And in my mind says, you are my kids. I got you. <laughs> so as I continue to build on this momentum and movement and continue to move forward, I've been blessed last year in May with a granddaughter. <laughs> Gabrielle Gabby. Isn't she beautiful? Yeah. She has my eyes. <laughs> I look forward to her coming to visit me in Minneapolis, running through the house, up and down the stairs, outside, going papa. But I often think that a bullet may come through that wall that a bullet may come through the front yard or the backyard. 
as it did when my wife Sandy was out this past Sunday. She was coming through the front yard when the shooting start, started, and I had just gotten home, and luckily, she didn't go. Excuse me. Our kids are reaching out to us. They want us to love them. They want us to want them. They want us to hear them. They want us to need them. I know you care. All I'm asking you is to please choose to listen. Thank you. It is said that guns don't kill people. Well, tell that to the parents, children, siblings, or even a best friend who has suffered the pain of losing a loved one to the senseless act of gun violence. In this country every year, there are thousands of young people that die from gun violence. And that does not include those that are injured or may be disabled for life. It has to stop. Bury guns, not our daughters and sons. Yes, indeed, family. I hope y'all, I hope those two um, powerful speakers, man, I hope it really dug into your spirit, to God be all the glory, dug into your mind, your hearts. You heard me, yes, indeed, one God, one love. Also, we have a report, too. Um, we have a vaping report. I want to go ahead and get to it right now. Give me one second. And I think this is very important of uh, kids doing pills and, and, and vaping. So um, this is by the New York Times. Um, vaping illness tracker. Hold on, let me let me cut this down just a little bit more. So I want you every I want you to hear every word that I'm saying. Um, this is from the New York Times. Vaping illness tracker. 2,602 cases and 59 deaths. And vaping. Y'all, everybody know what vaping is. You heard me? And we have, um, it says, the Center of Diseases Control and Prevention and state agencies have reported 2,602 long injuries, cases that requires hospitalization and 59 deaths linked to vaping. And they got all the states up here, Oregon, California, Utah, Montana, Nebraska, um, deaths and sickness, three in Texas, um, Kansas City, Illinois, Indiana, five deaths in Indiana, and Florida, Atlanta, Mississippi, all over the United States of America. So they say vaping related to um, emergency room visit visits most involve young people, younger people, especially young men and boys. So we have to be very careful. I know I had trouble with my son um, doing the vaping. I had to sit down. Matter of fact, he lied to me a few times. Say you vaping? No. So I, my youngest son, caught him. Well, looked into his draw, and so they had to me really start paying more attention to my son, and I confiscate. I had confiscated the vapings and uh, I had a real serious talk with them. And you know, they have vapings also have illegal drugs in them. Illegal drugs and vapings. Some vapings been found with uh, methamphetamine in them. Methamphetamine in them. Oh, Lord God, forgive me. Methamphetamine. You know? And um, so we have to just. Be very careful. Start really paying attention to our kids. You know. Uh, so. It's a lot of dangerous poisonous. That's in, that's in them vapors right now. And you know you got kids popping pills in school. Like for real. Kids popping pills in school. So we have to just really really start paying more attention. 
and what's going to school with our, with our kids, man. And not just our kids, our kids in our community that's vaping and doing all that. You know what I'm saying? There's one kid's passed away, kids dying from vaping, man, because it's poison. It's poison. It's being ejected into them vapors. You know? So we have to really, really do our best, man, to, um, um, to do better. You know, I know y'all hear me say it a lot, do better. But that's just true. Right here, it says, uh, patient with vaping-related lung injuries uh, typically shows up in emergency rooms with shortness of breath after several days of sympathies, of, uh, of symptoms, I'm sorry, of symptoms that resemble flu or, you know what I'm saying, flu or breathing injuries. Not breathing injuries or breathing, um, okay, hold on. Okay, a breathing, have you know, heart, belly can breathe situations like that, a breathing situation. And it says seven uh, percent. It said uh, um, a good percent of those who become ill remain. Eighty-seven percent reported using vapor um, products that contains THC. So it's a good. 2019 90 is reported uh 2019 99% of 8th graders 10% 20% of 10th graders and 12 25% of 8th graders worldwide is vaping 8th graders I know I worked in the school I work in the school system so I know exactly I have seen quite a few vapors I, matter of fact I took a few vapors for some kids in school myself and reported it to the office. You know what I'm saying? So uh, we got to we gotta really do our best, man, to look out for these kids. Watch out for the kids. Check your kids' bags. Check your kids. I'm, I'm for real, for real. You understand? Because this is killing kids, man. And they have poisonous inside the vapings. You understand? The vapings. So um, to God be the glory. So we're going to go ahead and we know, go ahead and do our best, man, to pay attention to what's going on with our kids. You understand? Not just our kids in our household, but our kids in our community. You understand what I'm saying? So, yes, indeed. One God, one love. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. Yes, indeed. Now, for five all in radio. We truly appreciate you. To God be the glory. I want to say God bless you. And please feel free to sign in to become a member another 7.5 all in radio. And as we as we move on, man, it's going to get better and better. To God be the glory. And I truly believe that. And I am so grateful to God and soon we'll be at 100,000 listeners soon to God be the glory so thank God for that you heard me so have a beautiful blessed weekend may the Lord continue to keep you and your family color in Jesus Christ's name amen to God be the glory family yes indeed you already know what time it is one God one love you are locked in come on yeah. you're listening to 97.5 all in radio where we have real life conversations about real life situations and we play gospel music from artists worldwide stay locked in one god one love 97.5 all in radio Cinema.